It's a wonderful thing to be able to be here and all this summer to study the Psalms. So let's ask the Lord to bless them to us today. Our Lord, we're thankful to you who have inspired your word and given it to us. We pray that we will listen to it today, that it will speak to us in a special way, and that everyone who's here will go out knowing that something incredible has happened in this service. And we pray this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. One of my favorite of Shakespeare's plays is King Lear. It's, it's a dark play, and for a while in the, in the 1800s, uh, it wasn't done the way that Shakespeare wrote it because it's so dark. But <clears throat> at the beginning of the play, there's a king, his name is Lear, hence the title, and he has these three daughters. And the king is an old man by that time, so he decides that he will divide up his kingdom among his three daughters. And he says to them, I want you all to tell me how much you love me. And if you tell me how much you love me, that'll depend on how much you get of my kingdom. He has three daughters, one named Goneril, one named Regan, and one named Cordelia. And so Goneril, the oldest, who really doesn't love her father, puts on this big, big speech about how much she loves him, how wonderful it is to be his daughter. The next daughter, Regan, also who doesn't love her father, puts on another big speech about how much she loves him and how wonderful it is to be his daughter. And then the youngest is Cordelia, who genuinely does love her father. And she simply says, Father, you know that I love you doesn't put on a big speech, doesn't make a big deal out of it. And her father is so angry that he throws her out of the, uh, the courtroom and he gives his kingdom to Regan and Goneril. It's not long after that that Regan and Goneril decide they would be better off without the king. And so, King Lear ends up going from the top of his game, being the king all the way down to standing outside in the rain with no friend except his fool, the jester. He had lost everything. And I wonder sometimes, what would we do if we were to lose everything? That's what this psalm is about here. It's about David when he is at a point in his life when he has almost lost virtually everything. And in Psalm 3, this is what he has to say. He says, O Lord, how many are my foes? Many are rising against me. Many are saying of my soul, there's no salvation for him in God. But you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the lifter of my head. I cried aloud to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy hill. I lay down and slept. I woke again, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of many thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God. For you strike all my enemies on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be on your people. One of the amazing things that we see in this psalm is that David, in spite of <clears throat> being in his son, has essentially engaged in a coup and has taken the kingdom away from King David. King David is running for his life, and yet, in the middle of this psalm, he says, I lay down and slept. I don't know if you've ever had any trouble sleeping, but it seems to me that if you're gonna have trouble sleeping, one of the places would be when you're surrounded by your enemies. I sometimes have trouble sleeping, and so I listen to podcasts sometimes. Uh, unfortunately, one of the podcasts that I listened to was about a guy who breaks into people's houses at night and chops them up in their bed. That did not help me sleep. 
I just I give you that as a tip. Don't listen to that if you're having trouble sleeping. I've had trouble sleeping ever since I was a kid. My parents used to have to pile things up against the front door because I walked in my sleep and I would go out in the yard. And then one day they, they left me at home while they were on vacation. I was about 14, I know. It was a different time. And they had five other kids, so I don't think it mattered. And they, they left me there and I had this some kind of a nightmare and jumped out the jealousy window and found myself out in the yard awake at the, that point. Sleeping is not the easiest thing sometimes. And yet, the amazing thing is that David here sleeps in spite of all those things that are going on around him. And I want you today to realize that what David is trying to tell us is that every believer should trust God during times of difficulty and anxiety. That today, if you face difficulty or anxiety, the real answer is to trust God. One of the ideas I've had about preparing teaching and, and sermons is to try to prepare a sermon in the place that the passage speaks of. So if it was a sermon about the unjust judge, go to a courtroom and prepare. Or if it's a sermon about the uh, the farm, go out to Pahokee and prepare. Uh, in this case, this is, a, this is a psalm about anxiety. And I spent about 10 or 11 hours in the, in the waiting room, a surgical waiting room at the hospital, all the while thinking about this psalm and about how it is that we can sleep in spite of the fact that things are against us. One of the things that we realize is that this psalm is written after David has realized what's going on. When you get home this afternoon, you can look at uh, 2 Samuel chapter 14 and 15 and 16, and it'll tell you the story of what's going on there. How Absalom, David's son, has decided that he will be the king, and he goes around and through gossip and through a variety of political maneuvers, he's able to throw David out of the kingdom. And David now is running away for his very life. So what is it that David teaches us? How is it that we can trust God during these times of real serious problem in our life? I think there are at least three things that we can learn from this psalm and from this story about David. The first is that we should trust God when you lose your job. David, you see, used to be the king he used to be the most powerful person in all of Israel. He had virtually everything that he could have wanted. He was protected on all sides. And yet now, as he writes this psalm, he's out in the desert somewhere by himself, being surrounded by enemy armies, not knowing when or if those armies will indeed come against him. And yet he's still able to sleep. I know that all of us have some kind of a job or another, but we need to be careful that we don't value our job above what we, we ought to. For some of you, it may be your job as a mother and you don't know what you'll do when your children move out. For others of you, it may be a regular job and you don't know what would happen if, if, if your boss came to you and said, listen, things are not working out, I'm sorry. You're, you're going to have to clean out your desk. This is your last day. Those are the kind of things that hurt us in a significant way. And yet David was hurt even more than that. Hurt even more than, than just having his job because this was his very calling. He was the king of Israel. And yet no longer. Now he slept outside like a dog surrounded by people who wanted to kill him, but he still slept. It's an amazing thing that David can say, in spite of all that, in spite of all the things that I was losing, in spite of all the things that were crashing in around my mind, I slept. Some of you know what that's like. Some of you can sleep anywhere, preferably not here, if you don't mind, but uh, I get it. Uh, but some of you have this, just this 
running mind that when you lay down, it just seems like it will never stop. And you can imagine what David was thinking about as he was there that night, knowing that if that foreign army or that other army that Absalom had raised against him decided to come against him, it would be his last night on earth. And yet, he slept. And so, all of us, when we face that, that kind of loss of, of our job, loss of our calling, loss of who we are, we can trust God because there's really no one else who can help us. And there's a second thing that David teaches us. Not only does David trust God in this point when people are against him, and you see that in the first couple of verses of the psalm where David says, look, all these thousands of people have come against me and they say evil things against me and they do all these things against me. David didn't just trust God when he lost his job, but he trusted God when he lost his, his status or his status. The, the play King Lear really is all about gaining status. You see, there's some people who think that in order for them to have more status, status, they have to pull somebody down. They can't raise themselves back up. That's what happened in King Lear with the two wicked daughters, Goneril and Regan. They both go to fight one another, wanting more and more of their father's kingdom until eventually they both die. David was running away, former king of Israel, now running for his life. And there was, you'll, you'll read when you read this passage, there was a man named Shimei. And Shimei hated David. And this gave him his great opportunity. Shimei stood up on a hill as David was walking by and he threw rocks at him. And he said, you are the worst king ever. You are a king who kills people. God will never let you be the king again. And yet in spite of that, Shimei saying all those things, David was still able to sleep. You know what it's like when people say things about you that aren't fair or that aren't true and how those things come back to you in, in, at night when you're lying by yourself and you think to yourself, why would they say that about me? Why would they say those things? It's not fair, it's not right, that's not who I am. But you don't know how to defend yourself against it. The only way that David had to defend himself was to trust in someone else. That is, to absolutely place his trust in God. Shimei follows along, saying all these things. And then David says, you God, are the one who will break the teeth of the wicked. It's kind of a, an unusual thing to find in a psalm that you, God, will break the teeth of the wicked. It, it's hyperbole. It's not really asking God to break out everybody's teeth. But in, in all likelihood, what's being asked is that God will shut the mouths of those who speak against him. Because when you have a mouthful of teeth, then you, you can't speak. And that's what David is calling for here. God, all these people that are speaking against me and thus speaking against you, the God of the universe, shut their mouths. And then David lays down and goes to sleep. There's a third thing that David trusts God, not just, he doesn't just trust God when he loses his job. He doesn't just trust God when he loses his, his status. He trusts God when he loses his family. David had already lost one child, you remember, uh, the whole story of Bathsheba and the child dying in infancy. But this is another child. This is a, an older child, Absalom. He's an adult. And yet he's, he's raising up this army to fight against his very father. You can imagine how David must have felt to see his father, his, his son, his very son, the son whom he had raised, fighting against the very things that he had spent his life building up. Some of you may be familiar with the uh, minister John Piper. 
a, fundamental, uh, a, a Reformed Baptist from uh, Minneapolis. John Piper has a son named Barnabas, and uh, everyone, I, I have been to Piper's uh, sort of weekend for pastors that he has every year, and, Pi and Barnabas, his son, would speak there every once in a while. But over the past couple of years, Barnabas has decided that Christianity isn't true, and he's become this huge star on TikTok. And all that he does in those, those videos on TikTok is to make fun of Christianity, to tell how horrible a childhood he had, to tell how he doesn't like the church and doesn't believe these things anymore. I can't imagine how John Piper must feel to see his son whom he raised saying those kinds of things, but it, it can't be as bad as David when his own son wanted, his own son wanted to kill him. But David trusted in God. And you remember what happened to Absalom. Absalom was riding along on a horse. He has long hair. And all of a sudden his hair or his head, it's difficult to tell from the text, either his head gets caught in the tree or his hair gets caught in the tree. When I was a kid, uh, I grew up in a fundamentalist Baptist church where to, for men to have long hair was a horrible thing. And that was why, because long hair got Absalom killed. That was what, no, really, that was why. So I've never been caught in a tree by my hair ever. Uh, so that's, that's why I get it cut like this. <laughs> the men come along, they see Absalom hanging there by his head and they stab him and he, he dies. There's a line in a, a, a movie called Road to Perdition and it says, sons were put on this earth to trouble their fathers. Maybe that's why Absalom was put on this earth, to trouble his father, David. It may not be your son who's giving you trouble. It may be some other member of your family. Maybe it's your parents who refuse to listen to you when you try to help them. Maybe it's your spouse who one day just decides that they don't want to be married anymore and they walk out and leave you. Maybe it is your daughter or your son, but whomever it is, I'm here today to tell you that the most important thing that you can do is not to trust in yourself because you will come to failure, but only to trust in God. That's, that's all the hope that we have, but that's enough. Because you see, in the end of the story, <clears throat> David gets put back as king. He doesn't end up dead with his daughter Cordelia the way that King Lear does. He ends up back as king. He ends up with his son Solomon building a huge, giant, beautiful temple. His son Solomon praying one of the greatest prayers in the Bible at the dedication of that temple. All of that because David knew his hope was trusting in God. And that's the reason that even though he was surrounded by all those people, he could lay down at night and sleep. Interestingly, there's only one time in the Gospels that we see Jesus sleeping. Now, he was a human being, so he slept every day just like we do. But there's only one time when the Holy Spirit has decided that we need to know about it. And that is when he and his disciples are out on a boat and a giant storm comes. And the disciples say to themselves, this is crazy, we're gonna drown, this is the most awful thing, somebody help us. And the fishermen turn to a carpenter and yet Jesus is in the front of the boat sleeping. If he can sleep during a storm, then we ought to be able to sleep during a storm. Our only hope, you see, lies in that God-man who came down, sacrificed himself so that we could know God. Years ago, I was probably 23 or 24, my, my mom had died like nine months earlier and my dad died that day. My wife was pregnant and I was working for a little tiny church 
didn't have any money, so we didn't have any insurance, certainly didn't have any money to pay anything. And we lived in a parsonage at the church, which was pretty rough. It, it, it had hot and cold running rats. It was, it was, it was not, a, not the kind of place that you would really want to want to stay. So here I am. I don't have a father. I don't have any money. I don't have any insurance. But I do have a pregnant wife, so that's something. And that night, about 2 o'clock in the morning, we're in this, it's an old wooden house, shotgun house. All of a sudden, we hear this tremendous crash come through. And I looked out of the bedroom into the living room, and there are two car headlights. I figured that probably was not where they belonged. But a guy had, I don't know if he was drunk or what, he had lost control of his car, run a stop sign, and run into the front of the house and torn the whole front of the house off. And he was just sitting in there like he was waiting for somebody to take his order at Burger King. Just sitting in there. Two o'clock in the morning, bashed the front of the house down. Finally, the police came, gave him a ride where he was going. The, the tow truck came, they towed the car away. The problem was the front of the house was just gone. That was the only house we had at, at that time. So we had to live there. And the problem was that whenever both of us went somewhere, we'd come back and half our stuff would be gone because there was no way to lock the door. There wasn't even a door. It was just flat out open. And then a few nights later, I remember my wife was having a baby shower. And this is in the days before men went to baby showers, thankfully. And, and I stayed home, both because I didn't want to go to the shower and because I didn't want any more of our stuff stolen. And I'm sitting there by myself, people are driving by, it was right on the road, people driving by looking in the house and thinking, what is going on with that? Guy's just sitting in a house with no front on it. I'm sitting there and I start to say, God, you know, this is not the way I, I it should have, this is not the way it should have been. This is not the way I figured life would go. I've got no money, got no parents, got no insurance. I got nothing. I'm trying to serve you, and yet I, I have literally nothing. And as I'm sitting there by myself, it was almost as if I heard a voice. Almost. I'm Presbyterian, I didn't really hear a voice, but it was almost. <laughs> almost as if I heard a voice. It was almost as if God said to me, if all that I have is you, is that enough? For David, it was. For David, trusting in God was the most important thing that he could do. Looking forward to the Messiah that would come was the most important thing that he could do. And that's the reason that David, even though he was surrounded by all those armies, he could lie down and sleep. And so I want you today, if you would, just take the next seven days. I'm not asking you to do it forever, but just for seven days. That when you lay down at night and all of those things that are bothering you, just turn them over to God like David did. Because you see, we can sleep because because God doesn't. And that's the great message that David has for us today.